2311 Race United Front Row Motorsports filed for an injunction on Wednesday. IndyCar has a new race on the streets of Arlington, a suburb of Dallas. Plus, let's look at the tier rankings heading into the Roval this weekend. Welcome back to Break Hard. I'm Matt. So I know last week I said I wasn't going to talk about the 2311 Racing FRM lawsuit incessantly, and I'm not going to. But anytime something new happens, I think it's worth talking about and updating. And that's what happened on Wednesday when FRM and 2311 Racing asked a judge for a preliminary injunction against NASCAR that would allow them to race in 2025 under the current charter agreement while their antitrust lawsuit against NASCAR continues. Now, of course, a judge is going to have to approve that. Um, and NASCAR has until October 26 to respond um, you know, to this preliminary injunction. What comes out of this is actually going to be very interesting because if a judge does grant them that preliminary injunction, that does seem to point towards you know, 2311 Racing and FRM might have a case in this situation, um, which you know that's up in the air still, but it also gives NASCAR a chance to respond. Part of this new injunction, though, that happened on Wednesday is a request, an immediate request of documents. Jeffrey Kessler, the lawyer representing the teams in this situation, has requested documents immediately from six key NASCAR members, that including CEO Jim France, Lisa France Kennedy, Ben Kennedy, NASCAR President Steve Phelps, NASCAR CEO Steve O'Donnell, and NASCAR's global strategy um, Vice President Scott Prime, um, in their you know quest to prove that NASCAR, of course, is operating as a monopoly and gathering all their information. It's a preliminary discovery period. They want that information. Will they get it? Ah, it remains up in the air right now. Uh, ultimately, NASCAR does not want to go to court. NASCAR does not want to open their books. NASCAR does not want to give out any more information than they need to, which is understandable. They are a private company after all. But how this goes on now past this preliminary injunction period will be very interesting. Jeffrey Kessler, the lawyer, of course, representing the two teams, spoke to the Associated Press, and he said that the two teams are willing to sign the charter uh, agreement for 2025, that new one that is starting, as long as they receive a court order which will release them from the clause that restricts teams from filing a lawsuit against NASCAR. So they're willing to sign as long as they get that court order that's like, hey, they are allowed to continue this legal action if they do sign this. That would be very interesting to see how that operates. I'm not sure how the court will side with that. I'm, I know what NASCAR's response, I think we all know what NASCAR's response will be uh, to that request. Uh, but coming out of this though, we got more information of the correspondence between 2311 Racing and NASCAR coming out of the, you know, proposed or the uh, mandated signing deadline that happened back uh, at the Atlanta weekend uh, last month in September. And after that, you know, period, you know, that deadline passed, uh, the communication between 2311 Racing and NASCAR continued. And we got a look at those emails on Wednesday. And I think they're actually very interesting to read. Um, 2311 Racing, of course, in their email basically lays out everything that they've said up to this point. Uh, the response from Steve Phelps and NASCAR. Of course, NASCAR is not commenting publicly on ongoing litigation, which is understandable. It's what would they'll always do, what any organization will always do. Um, so there's no conspiracy there. They're not, you know, you know, they're not talking because they don't want to. It's just they don't comment on ongoing litigation. Completely understandable. So this is really the only information that we have in terms of a response, if you will. And Steve Phelps and NASCAR came with receipts. And honestly, I think if you read over what they're all asking for, I think in this situation, it's not going to sway the public opinion by any means. And I'm not trying to sway public opinion, but I think that NASCAR's response was actually much better and much more structured than I originally anticipated, which maybe that's me selling them short in a, in, in a you know roundabout way. But the response from Steve Phelps and NASCAR was a very detailed timeline, uh, a very detailed timeline. They came with receipts and we got for the first time an official glimpse at the you know uptick in revenue that teams will be getting to which NASCAR said is detrimental to other industry partners. Uh, they said that in their email. I don't necessarily agree with that because I think tracks were getting a whole lot of money um, and maybe not reinvesting it. Uh, I can't say that for the ISC properties have actually reinvested a lot of money and their racetracks are typically fantastic. Um, as for SMI, I think there's some SMI tracks that definitely probably could have used, um, you know, reinvesting some of that more money 
that money more rather. One of the big sticking points for 2311 Racing was the IP and how NASCAR would own that. And NASCAR did respond to that in their email as well. And they said that they would not use the IP outside of what they typically use now. And if they were going to use that any further, they would of course uh, discuss that with the team. There's also the topic of NASCAR wanting to pay drivers like through an awards type of system to which 2311 didn't want to participate in that. And NASCAR responded and they're like, we're essentially like confused why you would not want your drivers to participate in that and um you know restrict them from the monetary gain that could come from that but you know they kind of were befuddled by that based on how i i read it so i'll include all of those um all of those emails, I'll post the pictures here um, right when I get done talking. That way you can pause and read them if you want. If you don't want to, well, skip ahead like 20 seconds and then we'll continue on. All right, outside of the NASCAR lawsuit news, IndyCar did make headlines on Tuesday when they announced a new race. Yes, for once, IndyCar did actually announce something, a new race. Something new is coming to the IndyCar schedule in March of 2026. IndyCar will race on the streets of Arlington, a suburb of Dallas where the Cowboys and the Texas Rangers play. Um, I don't necessarily know if this is the needle mover that IndyCar needs, but hey, let's take a look at it real quick. You know, if the Miami Grand Prix circuit is essentially just like the DH gate baby of the Monaco Grand Prix, even with a fake marina and everything, then this Arlington Grand Prix circuit is like the Timu baby of both Las Vegas and Miami. It has a lot of similar characteristics. The front stretch and kind of pit area is very reminiscent to that of uh, Las Vegas. There is a dual pit lane, much like what we have up in Detroit for the Detroit Grand Prix. Uh, it has a big 180 section, again, similar to things that we see in Las Vegas and in Miami. Miami is on a much smaller uh, scale, though. A very long back straightaway, nine tenths of a mile. Uh, again, reminiscent of sort of what they have in Las Vegas. It is a 2.73 mile circuit, 14 turns, and will be you know a partnership between IndyCar, the Dallas Cowboys, and the Texas Rangers. And I think that part of it is actually massive because IndyCar is notoriously bad at marketing itself outside of the Indy 500. And now they have two built-in marketing partners that will be able to market this race for the entire year of 2025 before this race happens in 2026, which is massive because you're going to get everybody that goes to a Cowboys game will have an idea that this is happening. Everybody that goes to a Rangers game will have an idea that's happening. So all the marketing is built in for them. So this race could actually be a success. Now, I am happy that one, IndyCar added a new circuit. They always talk about doing it, never actually do it. It got done in this situation. So round of applause for that. It also is happening in March, uh, notoriously a time in the season calendar where it's just kind of this dead period after you know the St. Pete race. So again, massive positive there. I don't think Arlington is the needle mover, though, that's really going to attract a ton of attention. Is it a destination that people want to go to at the beginning of March? I don't necessarily know if it is. It's not going to be like super hot, which is, I guess, is a good thing. But I'm not, I mean, personally, like, do I want to go to Dallas in March? No, I don't really want to go to Dallas at any point. But hey, at least it's a race that's happening on the schedule. Um, eh, Roger Penske said some things afterwards where he's like, we're not F1, which is true. You don't have the fake marinas at this track. So there's that. He also said that they have some of the most sophisticated race cars, which is just vehemently not true. It's not even the most sophisticated race car that Penske itself as a team fields that goes to the Porsche 963. But this car wasn't even the most sophisticated car when it debuted back in 2012. So that was a bizarre statement. But hey, I'm happy that it's happening. Uh, it's an interesting layout. It should hopefully produce good racing. Maybe, hopefully. Um, Jerry Jones said that, you know, as soon as he heard that Roger Penske's name was attached to it, he was immediately in, I guess that's a good thing. He also said that they have a thousand season ticket holders from the Cowboys that live in Monterey, Mexico. And he said, I guarantee you, they will all be here. They will all hear about this. So 
that's a good thing. Obviously, you know, IndyCar has a history in the Dallas-Fort Worth area in that Metroplex racing at Texas Motor Speedway. Um, there are a lot of a lot of um, Pato Award fans down there. Again, I guess that's a good thing. Uh, so hopefully they can come out and actually see their driver race since we're still not going to Mexico City, even though they probably could get that done if they actually wanted to. So I'm glad it's happening. I'm just not sure the streets of Arlington, a suburb, is really like the place to be. But hey, reserve judgment until we actually see a race there. Today's video is sponsored by Lockdown Brand. Head over to LockdownBrand.com today. Check out their t-shirts, their motorsport-inspired apparel, the collabs that they have with various drivers. Their hats are super popular amongst the motorsport community. Use code BREAKHARD10 at checkout for 10% off your order. All right, and now for the tier list before we head to the Roval this weekend. So out of Talladega into the Roval, who has the best shot of contending for a championship? Starting at the top are contenders of Kyle Larson, Chris Revelle, and now William Byron. Uh, he now moves his way up to the contender spot. Larson continues to bring the fastest car to the racetrack seemingly every week. The 20 car also very quick. We're headed to tracks that really line up well for him where he's won at the Roval. He's won at Homestead um, and he can go to Phoenix where he's won at as well. William Byron woke up advanced on already. He's the only driver that has locked himself into the round of eight before the Roval this weekend. He is now a contender. Somebody poked him with a stick. Like I said, a few weeks ago, he woke up. Denny Hamlin went from being in a really bad position to Finishing in the top 10 thanks to that massive 28 car wreck in the closing laps at Talladega. And by doing that, he is now plus 30 over the cutoff line. However, I still caution you. This is Denny Hamlin we're talking about. Tread cautiously. Alex Bowman still stays in his own tier of threaten him with Spire every single year because he is, again, in a pretty good spot to uh, move on to the round of eight. He always runs well at the Roval. Hopefully that didn't jinx him. Um, he should be in contention to move on to the round of eight. And then who knows? Playing with house money at that point, nobody expected them to be there. Could be contenders, Ryan Blaney and Tyler Reddick. Ryan Blaney, of course, got ran through by Alex Bowman um, coming to the stage win, uh, or stage finish rather, at Talladega this past weekend. Tyler Reddick did not have a very good weekend either. Tyler Reddick heading to a road course where he typically performs very well at. Ryan Blaney also won the inaugural race at the Charlotte Roval, thanks to Jimmy Johnson running into the back of Martin Truex Jr. Um, both of them could be contenders. Both of them have really good racetracks coming up in the round of eight. They just both need to get there. In the frisky if he survives category, you have Ch uh, Chase Elliott, who has never once been described as frisky in his entire life, but that nine team can make noise if they are able to transfer out of the round of 12 into the round of eight. Of course, he has won at the Roval before. He is a very good road racer. Would not be shocked to see him win on Sunday. However, SVG and AJ Allmendinger are both in this race. AJ Allmendinger has never lost at the Roval. Um, well, he's won there for five straight seasons. SVG, very good at road courses. We could see an entire round won by non-playoff guys, which would be interesting and would also tie us with the uh, most winners in a single season in the modern era of 19 which is great chase elliott though if he makes it into the next round it sets up again pretty nicely for him uh because martinsville is in that round and he is pretty good there never out until he's out that is joey logano yes it's an even year yes he should be in the championship four based on you know the historical uh performance of that team in even numbered years but he just hasn't had it this year and i don't think that he's going to go out and win at the roval he could point his way in if somebody else has a bad day so i'm not counting him out because he always seems to find a way he just finds a way and then cooked. That is Daniel Suarez, Chase Briscoe, and Austin Cendrick. Uh, barring a win this weekend at the Roval, I don't see any of them transferring into the round of eight. So I went ahead and just stuck a fork in them. They are done unless, of course, Austin Cendrick can just pull a row course, you know, out of nowhere. Uh, I When he joined the Cup Series, I really thought he was going to be much more uh, of a formidable driver on row courses like he was in the lower series. Just has not played out uh, that way at all. So I think they are done. So let me know in the comments what you think about the 2311 uh, FRM request for a preliminary injunction, the IndyCar road course, as well as the tier. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on uh, TikTok at Break Hard, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Break Hard Blog.